All right. Let's see. Okay, you should see the um, presentation uh, now. Let's uh, start from where we left off. So we are looking at uh, side effects, um, and we were looking at how to reason about uh, programs that uh, use side effects, right? In particular, we saw this idea of uh, um, aliases, and uh, we also introduced the concept of uh, physical and uh, structural equality. And we saw an example how to uh, interpret what happens when you ask questions about physical and um, structural equality. Right. So the other thing that uh, happens when you add uh, side effects to uh, a language is that uh, type system gets a little bit uh, complicated in uh, unusual ways. Right. So let's. Uh, so one of the ways it gets complicated is uh, um, this idea of uh, uh, value restriction. So that, this concept has a name, but let's keep that aside for the moment. Let's just look at uh, a very simple example that motivates. Uh, why, uh, what happens when uh, we add side effects to um, OCaml, right? So we have a purely functional language. We add side effects, something interesting happens. Consider this program, right? This program is very simple. So it says, uh, let R equals an empty list, OK? And then uh, it says, oh, create an alias for R, um, which is an int list, right? Um, and then R1 is an int list. Actually. Um, R happens to be an empty list, so that's fine. And uh, create a R2 such that uh, R2 is a string list. Um, so I'm explicitly ascribing types here, right? So you don't need these types. I'm using these types for a particular reason, right? I'm saying R2 uh, is string list. And uh, it has the same value as R. So these are just values, right? So the value of uh, that is going to be an empty list. So that is also fine. Um, and then I say, OK, return a pair of R1, comma R2. So both of these are empty lists, right? So the value is empty list. But because we had explicitly ascribed the types here, the, um, the pair will have the type int list star string list, right? Int list star string list. So the only thing that is interesting here is uh, um, R has type uh, alpha list, right? Because it's an empty list. Um, Empty list constructor is the same constructor for arbitrary uh, list contents, right? So R itself has type alpha list, but otherwise nothing is surprising here. You've seen this example um, previously, and uh, um, nothing is going on here. So let's uh, modify this example in a uh, simple way, right? So let's just do. Um, actually, let me clear. Uh, let me clear all the executed uh, output so that uh, I don't give away the surprise. Um, yeah, restart and clear output. Restart and clear outputs. OK, so now um, we had this example. Yeah, so we, we saw this example. I'm going to modify this example in a very small way. I'm going to say, instead of uh, an empty list, I'm going to make R a reference to an empty list. So I create a ref cell that points to an empty list. OK. And then correspondingly, I'm going to change the type of R1 and R2 such that uh, they are now int list ref and string list ref. Right? Uh, observe that this is int list and string list here. But here, uh, because I'm adding a reference uh, to a list here, so this becomes int list ref and string list ref. And uh, I simply return the pair of R1 and R2 now. If you run this program, right, we get an error, right? So we get a compiler error that says uh, on line three, right, this line, R happens to be an int list ref, right? But an expression that is expected of type string list ref because I say R2 is a string list ref. So the right hand side expression must be a string list ref. But uh, what I have here is an int list ref, right? Type int is not compatible with type string. So the question you have to ask is, OK, why is, why is this program um, showing an error, but a similar program here is not raising an error? Right? The only thing that I've done is I've added a ref here, and I've changed the types correspondingly to add refs. Right? Why is the compiler, compiler complaining? Right? Um, yeah, Sartak has the right answer. So. Is this because each cell can hold only? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. 
um it is because uh, each cell can only hold uh, one type of value um and uh, in order to in order to see what can happen right it is better to uh, ask the question of what happens if you allow um, the cell to hold uh, different sorts of values right if this program were allowed what can go wrong so here is uh, um so let's first look at uh, how ocaml is sort of catching this uh, um error right so ocaml has this idea of uh, value restriction right and uh, if you look at the type of uh, ref of uh, empty list right so the thing that you see here is it's not a alpha list anymore it is this uh, thing known as port underscore weak right and uh, so what uh, this says at a high level is that uh, um this particular r is only weakly polymorphic what does weak polymorphism mean weak can be unified with uh, exactly one type so you can unify if you unify it with uh, say integer that particular type gets uh, specialized to integer you cannot uh, unify that with uh, um a string later right the i wouldn't go too deep into what weakly pol weak polymorphism is but i'm just going to give you examples and try to explain what is going on that is the concept right that's the high level concept you can have something weakly polymorphic it can get unified with uh, one particular concrete type and that's it right you, you don't have uh, um you don't have the usual polymorphism which says uh, if i have a alpha list i can use it in a string list and a int list place right but why does this value restriction exist right so this is the example um let's say we we just take the same um first three lines right um i am writing this in uh in the slide as a markdown and not a cell because this wouldn't compi compile right if you run this code in ocaml this wouldn't compile i want to make a point here right so let's say r is a reference to an empty list and i say r1 is a um same alias right it's an alias to the reference um to an empty list i i ascribe the type uh, int list ref and similarly r2 is an alias i give it the type uh, string list ref now because r1 is an integer list reference i can store in it an integer list right because it's a reference to an integer list i can store an integer list into it i am going to take the singleton list one and i'm going to store it into r1 right now r2 and r1 are aliases of uh, the same underlying ref cell right so because r2 is a reference to a string list i can read i can dereference r2 right i dereference r2 uh oops what happens when i what do i get when i dereference r2 uh, because r2 is a string list reference i will get a string list right i am going to get the head of the um list right so the list head should be a string and i'm going to print end line the string so you can see what is going on wrong here right if i actually i'm able to do this i will get an integer i won't get a string so at this point the thing that i will get out will be an integer not a string because r1 and r2 are aliases of the same thing and uh, this is this breaks type safety right so we are storing in an int list in r1 and reading it out as a string list through r2 and this is bad and uh, so that's that's the reason why we have value restriction in the first place it turns out that uh, value restriction was uh, actually um something that the original designers of uh, a language a precursor to ocaml called standard ml Uh, did not come up with in the original standard so they formalized the uh, they initially implemented the language they added references and the first version of the language had this bug so they had to go and fix uh, the specification such that they added value restriction into the language so this is not something that uh, it seems so obvious when i explain it to you but uh, for the initial designers of the language they didn't uh, um, think about this case and uh, it is not surprising right so we don't always design languages with uh, um full proofs of correctness all the time so java initial version of java also got uh, a concept called subtyping wrong um because it got uh, the concept called subtyping wrong uh, um 
Java, unlike OCaml, which can erase all of the types, we saw type erasure earlier, right? So unlike OCaml, which can erase all the types, Java has uh, uh, must do dynamic type checking for uh, array type passing. Details are not important here. But the point is, language designers do get the designs wrong. And you have to sort of live with it forever uh, in the case of Java. But uh, in the case of standard ML and OCaml, we know we sort of knew how to um, how to not live with it and actually fix it and break code that uh, um, that uses that feature. Anyway, so um, so if if this feature were allowed, it breaks type safety. This code will check fault, right? If I run it uh, um, in OCaml, if uh, this code type checks, so. So this uh, this uh, concept called value restriction exists. Um, in in OCaml, value restriction is implemented as a syntactic check of what expressions are allowed on the right hand side, right? What expressions are allowed on the right hand side, right? If uh, the expression on the right hand side is is um, belongs to a particular class, right? I won't define what the class is. The details are not important here. Then the variable that uh, uh, is on the left hand side of the expression gets a weakly polymorphic type. So because this is weakly polymorphic, and you first unify it with the int list reference, right? The type gets unified to an int list reference. And here, uh, because this is a different uh, type here, which is a string list reference, int is not compatible with string. Details are beyond the scope of this course. It's not important, but uh, it is important to know that the concept called value restriction exists. And here is an example of uh, what can go wrong if uh, um, value restriction did not exist. OK, so how is uh, value restriction relevant to you? Right. So when you write uh, programs in OCaml, um, you can uh, do partial application. Right. So since value restriction is implemented as a syntactic check, it is not precise. Right. There are examples where uh, um, something is OK to be fully polymorphic. But because of the way value restriction is exit, uh, implemented, which is an approximate way of saying it's it's conservative, right? So it looks at the right hand side expression. It just says, OK, um, this fits to this class of things which I don't know, which might go wrong. So I'm going to give it a weakly polymorphic type. So here is an example that shows up in practice, right? Um, when you do partial application. So here is an example. So, um, so I defined this function called a swap list. Right. What it does is it takes a list of pairs, right? Pairs of values, and uh, for each element in the pair, it swaps it. Right. When you have uh, the pair AB, swapping is BA. Right. For each of the elements in the pair, and returns a new list. And the way I implement it is through partial application of uh, map. So I want to do a map over each element in the list. And for each of the elements, I'm going to take a comma b, and I'm going to return b comma a, right? So this is a partially partial application of a map where you only provide the higher order function, right? And if you happen to apply swap list with the list l, then what you end up getting is uh, um, the swap list, right? But if you look at the type of this, it is a weakly polymorphic type because uh, fun function application this way. Uh, in lead binding happens to be one of the patterns where OCaml says there can be arbitrary effects here. So I'm going to make it weakly polymorphic, right? So that's the idea. So what is the pro So let's look at the type, right? The first, the type is seems uh, okay, right? It, it takes a polymorphic thing um, week two, a polymorphic thing week three, a list of those things, and returns a uh, week three, week two list. But it so happens that these are weakly polymorphic. The problem is that if you use this in a context, the swap list in a context where uh, you apply it on uh, two different types. So here is an example. So I apply swap list first on a singleton list with uh, integer 1 and string hello. So the result I would expect is uh, um, a singleton list again, where you have a hello and 1, right? And I again apply swap list on one comma one, which is integer integer. So you get one one. You should get one one out. But if you run this program, um, I mean, if you compile this program, OCaml will complain because uh, because swap list is weakly polymorphic. The first application here, right, forces uh, 
unifies the types with uh, integer and string. This becomes int string list and string int list, right? And uh, because this is weakly polymorphic, this gets unified. So here it is expected that uh, the type here is an integer, the type here is a string, just like the previous application, right? And that's not true. And uh, here we have an integer. So OCaml complains this expression has type in, but an expression uh, uh, is expected of type string, right? So this is what uh, you'll get. But there is an easy fix for this, right? If you happen to encounter uh, um, value restriction, so weak polymorphism, when you apply partial application, um, you can just do eta expansion. So recall that uh, eta reduction takes an expression which is lambda x, mx, and then reduces that to m. So eta expansion goes the other way, right? If you give some arbitrary lambda term, uh, eta expansion just says uh, add a add a lambda to the front, lambda x, and then apply the text. Right? So here is an eta expanded version of uh, the original expression. So what do I mean by eta expression, eta expansion? I just take L as an argument here, right? And I apply L. So the original definition happened to be a partial application, right? I did not take an L. I did not apply an L. I was, so I was uh, using the idea of partial application. Here, I'm not doing partial application. I define a function that takes one argument, and here it's fully applied, right? List.map, the higher order function, and list. This happens to be uh, an expression. It's not a let binding of a variable, but a function. So this weak polymorphism does not kick in, right? Um, and you get a fully polymorphic uh, um, type that you would expect, which is alpha, beta list, and beta alpha list. And now this example works. So it is um, the takeaway from this section is uh, it is not important to um, know what all expressions will um, will trigger weak polymorphism. But uh, if you encounter weak polymorphism while programming in partial application, you just eta expand it. You add uh, the additional uh, binder, right? You define it as a function. It will it will go away. So that's the trick to get across weekly polymorphism. Okay, so that uh, that is weekly polymorphic um, uh, weak polymorphism in OCaml. Um, so so far, what we've seen, we have introduced uh, references, right? And all of the discussion has been about uh, references. So references are one way to introduce uh, um, mutations, mutable features in OCaml. OCaml also has this concept of uh, mutable um, record fields, right? So you can think of mutable record fields as uh, um, how you would operate on a structure in C, right? So that there is going to be syntax and semantics. We'll first, okay. Uh, so there is a question in the chat. I'm going to try to answer that. Why is partial application considered to be weakly type? Without going into details, right? Um, the the expression on the right hand side is a function application, right? Um, and here I'm defining a variable, right? This is some some term. It's it's just a binder. It's not a it's not a function definition. It's just a binder. And I'm doing a function application here. So the high level idea is that uh, when you do function application, there can be arbitrary effects internally which might uh, end up uh, doing something similar to this one internally, right? Because OCaml cannot, when you do type checking, right? You don't actually go and look at the definition of the function. You just look at uh, what those types are and try to apply, right? So, um, so OCaml is sort of uh, assuming that there are arbitrary effects which it cannot reason about when you uh, do this let uh, definition when you do define this uh, variable. But here you are defining a function, right? And uh, this is not, I mean, because you are defining a function that does not apply. Actually, there is a, I mean, the, the um, there is, there isn't a precise definition of when to do um, value restriction in OCaml or the, um, or uh, uh, standard ML. So both of the languages are ML-like languages, which take uh, lambda calculus, right? 
and uh, add uh, mutations on top so these are uh, these are approximate right so it's hard to give a precise definition of why it should be considered right? so i'm i'm not going to give details because that goes beyond the scope of the course you don't need to understand the de details is what i would say um but if you are interested you should just check for uh, you should um, search for uh, a paper called uh, um relaxed value restriction in ocaml i think that defines that defines the original value restriction and how uh, ocaml does value restriction in a relaxed fashion it actually allows uh, weak polymorphs so i'll just refer you to that paper okay so let's move on um okay so mutable record fields so there are um, there is going to be syntax and semantics right so for syntax um when you define records we we've, we've seen records uh, uh, earlier um in records all you define is a label and a type you can make fields mutable in a record by just adding this mutable keyword to the front okay and uh, in particular references in ocaml are actually just a syntactic sugar over uh, mutable record fields they actually have the same representation internally so whenever we define this type uh, alpha ref what we are actually defining is a um a record right with a single field called contents whose uh, whose type is alpha right and it's a mutable record field so you can change the contents uh, of this record okay, so that's the idea here this is exactly how references are defined in ocaml so references are not uh, even though we saw references is a primitive thing earlier references are in turn implemented with uh, mutable record fields okay and uh, yeah you can you can just create a um, record just like we used to earlier so here is a ref function that we saw earlier which given an initial value creates a record um, with contents set to that uh, value so you just create a record right where you say contents equals x right that creates a record um and uh, dereferencing like getting the values the same as uh, the record uh, syntax right so when i dereference uh, uh, a reference all i do is uh, i use the dot syntax so the record dot contents which is the label uh, for the field and the additional thing that we have on top of uh, um records is this uh, way to update the contents so assignment right of a reference to a new value is done like this so you take the record dot contents right left arrow like less than minus new value so this is sort of a syntax that we use for assignment to um records so that's all we have for records right and uh, yeah okay so let's look at how we use it with an actual example um so the point is you can do so ocaml is a functional programming language but you can write because of all of these mutable features right you can write um, programs that you would uh, naturally write in say c so we are going to look at uh, a program for uh, writing doubly linked list so this might seem seem strange right oh you have this functional language we've been saying how functional programming is so great and so on but why would you want a doubly linked list right doubly linked list has a particular nice property right you can just um, um if you have a reference to some um element in the list which you need to delete you can delete that in constant time so this is not true with uh, um the list definition that we seen so far right because the list definition is defined uh, like an onion right so you have the head and the tail head and the tail head and the tail if you want to delete one element in the middle it is linear time right so you have to go all the way take the tail of the list um tail of the list for where the head is the element that you want to delete and you have to reconstruct the rest of the prefix of the list right so this is both um, time inefficient and uh, memory inefficient of course you want to do efficient data structures right you want to do circular linked lists and um um yeah doubly linked lists and 
sequences and ropes and all of these fancy data structures you uh, you you know behave much better than just purely functional ones so hence uh, in ocaml we don't um, we don't particularly look down upon imperative programming right we sort of uh, provide enough features for imperative programming um, such that uh, you can get your job done right this sort of is a nice balance right if you look at uh, haskell for example um, that i suppose is pure functional programming which has its benefits i mean it's not like you can't get the performance uh, um, that you need but you have to you have to try a little harder so lot of the knowledge that we built based on mutable data structures you have to sort of uh, um, reimagine and then be clever to implement that um, but in ocaml you can just do it directly and the history of why it is this way is uh, unlike haskell which is uh, which came from academic tradition ocaml also came from academic tradition haskell is a playground for experimenting with uh, new language features right um, so haskell has this motto which says uh, avoid success at all costs right so this is very funny but uh, this is very true haskell is sort of um, always forward looking less uh, um, it is less strict about having advanced features into the language merged into the language so haskell happens to be a uh, um the core language is simple but contains so many advanced features it's just a playground it's a beautiful playground for exploring high level ideas of course it has its benefits but ocaml has always been a language for uh, getting things done right it is uh, targeted at uh, engineers in particular so you want to write large software functional programming has its benefits so let's let's develop a language which uh, sort of appeals to um people who might not go for functional programming in the first go right so that's the sort of uh, place where uh, ocaml is targeted at and in particular ocaml initial versions of ocaml right try to be as close to um as close to fortran programs right so people are writing fortran and then um so the ocaml developer said okay we would like those programmers to use better abstractions but we don't want them to give up all of their knowledge right they know how to write good fortran programs how can we take that and transplant it into a better setting so that is why we have all these beautiful features in ocaml so that's a bit of history so with that uh, we can look at how we implement uh, doubly linked list um okay so so we define a node in a linked list with uh, usual things right we have a value um which is alpha the node is also typed so the type we define here is alpha node it has a value that is alpha it refers to it has the next and the previous uh, pointers so the next pointer is a uh, is a alpha node option right it can either be there or not and the previous uh, is also alpha node option and these are mutable right you can change the next and previous okay so that's the definition of node and uh, typically for a doubly linked list uh, if you implement it in c um, the head will be just a pointer to a node right and uh, an empty list will be represented by a null we don't have null here right we have to use uh, some different type so so what the type that we define here is uh, alpha dl list a doubly linked list is a reference to a option node right so it's a reference so it can be mutated right and it's an option so that you can represent uh, the fact that uh, an empty list is just a reference to a none option so empty list is ref none and uh, non empty list will have some node right and some node can have a previous and next and so on. okay so that's the difference right so because we don't want to use null we have a separate type for doubly linked list and node node is precisely the same as what you would have in c and uh, here we have a different type just so that we can get across this uh, um idea of uh, avoiding the use of nulls okay so how do we create a empty linked list an empty linked list is just ref none it's a reference to none right and um, yeah if you want to get the first node take the list t and then dereference it so that can be 
um so what does it give it gives you an option right it is either none or uh, some node actually we can run this oops i need to run this we can run this to look at the type so first takes a doubly linked list and gives you a node option so if it is none you know that the list is empty if it is some node then the list is not empty so in order to check if the list is empty we dereference that uh, um p reference right and if it is none then the list is empty right so is empty is uh, alpha dls to boolean right it is true or false and we define helper functions to just fetch uh, the value the next and previous so we just use dot right? the syntax highlighting is a bit off here uh, it should be black but its uh, value is sort of uh, one keyword that you can use in ocaml but it's not um, I mean, um, it is also allowed for uh, variable names so that's why it's green but otherwise it should be black right this should be black so given a node you can get the value right alpha node to alpha you can get the next and the previous right and these are uh, optional values they are optional values because uh, next and the previous may not exist so we use options okay so let's look at a few functions um these functions are going to look exactly the same as what you do in terms of logic right exactly the same as what you do in c um except that we have these minor differences right um, we don't check for null we actually do a pattern match and things like that so we are going to implement this insert first function so what does this do it takes a list and a value and uh, inserts a new node it creates a new node whose value is the given value right and it insert inserts a new node as the first node in the list right so if you have a list Uh, and you give it a value insert first creates a new node which has the value and then insert it that's the first question and it returns the node newly created node right so what do we do so we take the list right and the value we first create a new node right a new node is created uh, as saying because it's going to be the first node the previous is none right the next one is whatever the current uh, first of uh, the list is right and the value is v so we have created the node here n right and if t is empty list so if the list is empty then we are not doing anything here um but if the list is non empty right if the list is non empty there is an old first right and because we are inserting the new node before the old first old first previous is uh, this particular node we use some n because we have to wrap it in a optional type so the old first uh, points to uh, this newly created node we update this reference because n is the first node now we update the list reference to some n and then we return n okay so um so that's the function and what does it do it takes a, a doubly linked list it takes a value it inserts a new node which has um, the value as its uh, contents at the first position and returns you the same node okay so that's what insert first does um okay so now let's look at uh, another function insert after so what does insert after do insert after uh, takes a node to insert after takes a value right to um insert in the new node it first creates a new node called n prime right whose value is v and inserts it after n the given node n right and it returns the newly created node n prime right? so this is what it's doing so again just like before uh, we create a new node for uh, um that has a value v right and because we are inserting after uh, um n the previous of the um of the new node is going to be the node that we are inserting after the next node is going to be the next node of n okay and uh, if the next node uh, does not exist then we do nothing if the next node is some old next 
then we have to update the uh, previous pointer of the next node, old next node. So we do that here. Old dot uh, next is previous and sum n prime. Right. This is the newly created node. And finally, what we do is uh, we update the um, next node of the node that we are inserting after to this newly created node. We return the node. Of course, I am sort of hand wavingly explored, um, explaining this, but you can just draw this out and this is just work out, right? If you've done doubly linked list before, which I assume you have, this is no different, right? We just use uh, um, like OCaml, some OCamelisms to explain it. Um, so that's insert after. So yeah, del delete is going to be just the usual one. The only thing that we have to do in delete, as we do in uh, um, in C, yes, uh, we have to update the previous pointer and the next pointer, right? So we have to do both of that. Um, and uh, and that's it. It just works out. Okay. So, okay. So we've defined all of these uh, imperative features that you would find, right? So we've defined uh, um, insert and uh, remove, but we can also do functional features in it. So the thing that we like with... Um, uh, higher order functions is we can do iterations over uh, um, iterations over any data structure, right? So we define an iter function, right? Iteration function takes a list and takes a higher order function f and applies f on each value in the list from left to right. So it is it is just iterating. It is not uh, returning you anything useful, um, but it's just uh, going through the list and applying this f function. So because f is not returning anything useful. It is just an alpha to unit function. So we run f for effect. It might just be like print each value or something like that. Um, so it takes a list and then this higher order function and applies it over each element. So we, we write a recursive function for the loop, right? Um, yeah, I can possibly do it uh, not like this. So I don't want to introduce new syntax. So. Um, so I can write it like this. So I'm so I'm uh, going to call this function with uh, whatever is uh, the result of dereferencing t. So that can be an optional type if uh, the list is empty. So in which case we don't do anything. If it is uh, not uh, empty, so we get some e1, right? Some node, and we extract the value in that node and apply the function f that we supplied. That's the higher order function that we got. And we simply loop, loop um, until we um, reach the end of the list. Oops, uh, unborn value L. Okay, so yeah, I'm avoiding some syntactic sugar that I had used. Um, anyway, so loop is a recursive function that takes a list and then iterates to the end of the doubly linked list, right? So the whole function has type, take a doubly linked list, take this higher order function, right? And apply it to each element. And it's not going to return anything useful, so it returns unit. Okay, so this is the termination case for the um, for the iteration, so which, is, which returns unit. So this whole function returns unit. Okay, so we've done iteration, but you can also imagine doing folds, right? If you implement fold over uh, the doubly linked list, you can use that to implement iteration and whatnot. So you can do all the things that you want. Um, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how to use these things. Uh, so let's let's play with this, right? So let's create a um, w, empty doubly linked list. Let's first insert uh, a node with zero in it, and then I'm going to insert one after it, right? So I insert first a node with zero in this list, which returns the node n0, right? So that's the first node. And I'm going to insert a new node with value 1 after n0. Um, let me finish this. And then we insert uh, a new node with 2, right, as the value. Uh, OK, so we just create a, a doubly linked list with 0, 1, 2. As the contents, um, Srisha has a question. Sir, in the previous functions, why did we wrap the pattern match with begin and end? Should we always do that? 
um where do we do begin and end here um oh here okay yeah you don't need it you can do uh you can do this if you want the reason for uh, doing that is um uh if you write it like this right the ocaml will interpret this as uh, something like this by default so when you have a i mean this is unfortunate i mean this is syntactic uh it's a bad syntax right so uh, essentially the parser will look at uh, the original definition as a definition like this all of this comes under uh, uh, the non case right so that's uh, that's not what we want here right so the semicolon is to blame because i use a semicolon here it is unclear whether the semicolon ends the whole match with block or this single expression and it always ends the closest expression so it ends the this expression and this everything else comes under uh, this block and that's not the intention so that's why we needed uh, we needed this begin and end but you can also use brackets like this so if you use a bracket like this um open close then that will also work that's the that answer to your question shisha okay yeah i don't uh, i don't prefer brackets because uh, begin and end are nicer to read and it's a bit uh, difficult to read the the brackets um okay so okay so let me move on so i created uh, a linked list with uh, three um, nodes 0 1 so it prints the actual values right um we can have a look actually so the list itself is weakly polymorphic because uh, this is a this happens to be a application which uh, um creates an effect right and it turns something that is polymorphic but uh, just like we saw earlier right this uh, value restriction because of value restriction we have a weakly polymorphic uh, doubly linked list initially the doubly linked list is uh, empty right so it's uh, its content is none so when you see content is none it is a reference that points to um a reference which is a box which has none in it so it's an optional value but it's a reference right so the contents is none and then what we did is we inserted the first node in the list with content zero right and what you end up having is n0 is a int node and the value is zero next is none previous is none okay so that's uh, fine and uh, n1 is also a node right it is also an integer node its value is 1 its next is none right because that's the last node its previous is this node 0 right so it says uh, previous is sum this whole thing is just referring to the content here right um so previous of n0 is none so that's the first node so previous is none right the value of the first node is zero because the value is zero right and uh, we have we see something curious here right we see next equals some cycle why do we see this because next equals some the same node that we are defining here right so you can sort of replace this with n1 here right this will be n1 um but that is not what ocaml prints um because uh, ocaml the um, the pretty printer tries to um tries to recursively traverse through the entire data structure until it can uh, sort of uh, print everything but that's not true here right if you keep uh, going on and on uh, with this i mean this is an infinite loop right so you have a um, next pointer from uh, n0 to n1 and a previous pointer from uh, n1 to n0 so if you try to do it naively if you just go ahead and print everything uh, this would print uh, the entire uh, 
I mean, this will not terminate, right? And just like graph traversal, what you do when you traverse graph is you sort of have visited nodes. And uh, the current node that you're defining is uh, happens to be visited. So here it's a cycle, but you can sort of abstractly, right? This should be N1 is the idea. N1 is is not defined until this value is defined. So you can't define, it's like a chicken and egg problem. So that's why the pretty printer avoids printing N1 and just print, cy print cycle, but that's the intention. And similarly, uh, what is the last uh, expression? That is uh, that is an integer node. We don't give it a name, so we don't actually see uh, anything here. Its value is two, that's the last node, so next is none. And its previous is going to be N1, right? Its previous is going to be sum. This whole thing, right? This whole thing is uh, this whole thing. And uh, there are cycles here, but that's the reason. Um, the reason there is a cycle is just what I had explained uh, now. OK, so we sort of see what is printed. Let's see if it actually works out, right? So I'm going to iterate over the list and print the values. Um, I'm doing printf percentage d. I know that the values are integer. I'm introducing a new line character, and I'm also flushing the buffer for every printing. Um, this is strictly not necessary, but I'm just uh, using it because uh, um, this JavaScript interface that we are using expects uh, a flush in order to show the output. But otherwise, I'm just printing printf uh, printing out uh, the values zero and two. OK, so that's a uh, doubly linked list. Um, and uh, so we've uh, seen references. We've seen mutable um, mutable record fields. And we saw that uh, references are, in fact, implemented using mutable record fields. That is the third way of introducing mutations, uh, general purpose mutations in OCaml. Those are arrays, right? Just like you have arrays in C, arrays are useful in OCaml. Um, so again. Um, arrays are contiguous data structures, right? They have efficient accesses and so on. They are not linked. Um, so there are reasons to have arrays in the language. And uh, so we are, since we are looking at uh, a new primitive, we are going to look at the syntax and semantics, right? So there is going to be static semantics, the types, and the dynamic semantics, what it actually does. So syntax, right? First thing that we do for declaring arrays is uh, we use the syntax, which is similar to lists, but has this bar, right? So if I write uh, something like this, this would be a list which has into one, two, three. For arrays, we use this syntax. Um, again, this syntax, just go with the syntax. So this defines an array that has one, two, three. And we have a static semantics. We have a type called array. And uh, A is an integer array. Right? And uh, so we want to do two things, right? We want to read the elements of the array and uh, store into a particular indices. And uh, the syntax is, uh, um, is here. So if you want to retrieve the ith element of uh, an array A, you do A dot open bracket I close bracket. Right? So this is, uh, so I'm going to retrieve the first element of uh, um, the array, so a dot zero, so that gives me one. Right? Um, and uh, because we have type safety, right? We have type safety. We cannot, uh, unlike C, we we cannot allow you to read arbitrary indices. That would just be wrong because the memory in that uh, location could be anything, right? I don't know what it is. And similar to, um, say, Java or JavaScript or uh, any other language which enforces type safety and memory safety, um, whenever you access an array index, we always check the bounds, right? Hence, uh, if you access indices which are outside of the bounds, you will get an error. So here, I'm accessing the element at index 0, but the length of the array is 3. So the maximum index that I have is 2, right? So this, this will raise an exception, right? This is not returning some arbitrary value. This actually raises an exception saying invalid argument array index out of bounds. This is quite important for type safety, right? Because, uh, yeah, that could be arbitrary things there. Integer is fine. Imagine you are uh, you have an array of, say, trees or something, 
and then i can't make up trees uh, by reading arbitrary bits that would just be wrong um, okay so that is uh, array read and you can store into array using the left uh, arrow syntax so here is uh, i'm i'm so what i'm doing here is i'm updating the value at index 1 to 0 okay so um so i use the syntax and i just retrieve the array here so i update the, the value at index 1 to 0 so i get 0 1 0 3 instead of 1 2 3 which was earlier and i can access it here so to 0 arrays behave very similar to arrays in c actually their memory layout is also very similar right so uh i'm not going to say much about this because you programmed with arrays uh, already in um, c um you should look at the array module at this point you know enough vocamel to sort of uh, um, look at uh, uh the standard library that has certain types and that has documentation you should be able to understand what's going on there is nothing surprising here it's what it's like uh, c like arrays okay so just to conclude this uh, lecture so there are benefits to immutability right programmer doesn't have to think about aliasing so we don't have this notion of uh, what physical and uh, um structural equality is the language implementation is free to share objects right um, if i happen to have the same value which happens to be um, allocated at uh, as two different objects and if the values are the same then the compiler can internally choose to uh, use a single object and because i don't have any uh, mutable features i wouldn't be able to tell a difference right i can only use structural equality and structural equality anyway tells that both objects are the same so this uh, that makes things simpler it also having mutability also introduces the problem of uh, value restriction right so now you have to think about what weak polymorphism is and so on um it is easier to reason about what your program does your program has a specification which is fully defined by the type right but when you have mutability the type doesn't capture what is going on the program might have some updating a global variable which is not captured in the type so it is not at all clear what it is doing right so um, there are benefits to immutability and when you start doing parallel programs right having immutability is great because if i have something that is purely functional i can create seven copies of it all of these will not interfere with each other because there is no mutation going on but you cannot do this when you have mutable features right if each of them has a reference which it is internally updating if you create seven copies and run it in parallel all of them are operating on the shared data structure you will have all the problems of uh, parallel programming which i think you will study in operating systems later um but that said mutability is useful right just like we saw doubly linked list we want to use things like arrays which have certain memory representation we want to use hash tables we want to use uh, um red black trees and what not so all of these have implementations in ocaml um so all of these are implemented in an imperative fashion right so what is the take away from this lecture the idea is that uh, use immutable data structures unless performance cannot be compromised right don't go for mutable uh, implementation start with an immutable one and if you see that there is uh, necessary for uh, uh, performance where you can where you think mutations will give you better performance then go for it right? this is what standard library does standard library has uh, hash tables and um, mutable sets and so on they are all implemented in a mutable way but have an interface which sort of looks very functional i think that's a reasonable compromise to go with and that's all i had for this uh, lecture i'll stop here i think i've already taken um five more minutes so i'll see you tomorrow thank you very much